Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners, and thank you for listening. I don't know what to think, but I think we're in one of the most critical moments of American history at this moment, and I don't know what the answer is because everybody loses. You know, the commentators that I have most admire are those that are saying everybody loses. We're not addressing health care. We're not addressing infrastructure. We're not addressing energy policy. We're not addressing immigration. We're not even minding our, our P's and Q's in the world's arena. We're talking about this president and it's consuming everything. It's sucking all the oxygen out of American life. And no matter what happens, if he survives, if he's removed, everybody loses. Okay. And, and by the way, listeners, this week's show is about this. We have a discussion with President Jefferson, which really, we try to offer some perspective. We try to be sober and, and objective and, and neutral. You know, it's always a little dicey to play that game with Jefferson because he's dead, but he's here. <laughs> And he kind of knows what's going on, but he's very hesitant, or, uh, sometimes hesitant well, to see, comment on it. And But we, you know, we don't gain like, anything by having Jefferson opinionate that way. You want you want historical perspective, right? Right, and he, he does that. Um, but it's not like I, – I, I don't think he reads the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, but somehow he knows He things. knows a little. Yeah. Yeah, not I'm very still much. Trying to figure that out. Uh, me too. Anyway, it was um, it was. So, a someone asked good me about this. I was in Norfolk, and I gave this talk, and these and the, uh, these wonderful people, and and a woman who was a very smart woman said to me, um, "How do you know what Jefferson thought?" You know, <laughs> good question. Like, what, what, I'm waiting for said, the answer. She on said, that, "You yeah. sound so confident, like you know what he thought." And I said, "Well, actually, I do, because he's he's kind of a simple guy. You know, he he, he early on." Um, drank in these enlightenment principles and he stuck with them for the rest of his life and we sort of know what he thought about almost everything and it's not it's not dense or complex it's kind of straightforward it, it, I said of all the characters I do Jefferson's the easiest because we know what he thought I don't know what Robert Oppenheimer thought of certain things or Meriwether Lewis thought of certain things. You kind of know what things. Adams thought, though. I know what Adams thought. Yeah. But I love Adams, and more now than ever. Checks and balances, Mr. Jefferson. <laughs> Checks and balances. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that Adams was right, as always, that this system only works if you have a way to hold people accountable. I'm going to put that on a tape loop. Yeah. Adams was right, as now usual. Let me, now let me praise, let me praise Chrysler. I'm praising Chrysler. Yeah. It was a good discussion to have. I, I do want and you did to say that you did see the bobcat, but go ahead. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like a, you've been to England. You've come I'm, back. I'm a it's nicer a, guy. A, you know? Yeah. There's yeah. a great picture of you uh, that you shared of you at Abbey Road, and that's a whole barefoot at Abbey Road. You know, right? Making a, a spectacle of myself. I just want a qualifier for this. Yes, um, sir. You, because of your busy schedule, you're due to fly to Chicago tomorrow. If the yeah, it's snowing don't here get in snowed, Dakota. Yeah. We oft times pre-record shows and we don't know what's going to happen by the time this well, one comes out today is the 10th of october it's a thursday who knows what's going to happen this show won't air for about nine days i'll tell you what's going to happen the crisis gets worse not better you think yeah i think we're i mean look i don't say this lightly i've been sleepless i've been I, i'm i'm filled with anxiety but yeah, I, I, think I get all this from you and you force me to optimism i can't help i it. feel that we are on the, we are on the brink of the whopper constitutional crisis and that it's going to get worse because here's the deal you know when they say of the cuban missile crisis that kennedy um, and khrushchev looked eye to eye and one of them blinked who's blinking here so one of two things happens either the president blinks and says i will cooperate with your investigation or he doesn't. If he doesn't, it's a deeper crisis. Then the courts get involved. Either the courts uh, make a pronouncement that he's willing to listen to, or they're not. It gets deeper. In other words, what's the exit? So try to, try to imagine what how, what's the resolution of this. How does this come out that's not a whopper constitutional crisis? I don't see the president saying, "Wow, folks! Now that I think about it, I've done a terrible thing." Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but I was a young adult when this when Watergate happened, Me and too. I, I actually I lived in D.C. at the beginnings of that, okay. and ended up back here at the endings of that. Think of what happened. And eventually, Nixon turned over the tapes. Yeah, you know, the Attorney General went to jail. John Mitchell. There, there were things that happened, and this was prior to social media. It was prior to the internet. There was only those newspapers covering it and somehow the republic survived and the right thing ended up because being done. so because the executive in extremis 
did the right thing. It doesn't hurt to be optimistic about it, though. I just ask everyone who's listening, our friends, I have lots of friends out there. I've met some new ones in Norfolk this last week. We have friends in uh, St. Simon Island down in uh, Georgia and in, in, in the Central Valley of California throughout uh, Colorado and Salida and the Dakotas and, um, of course, our, our, our sort of flagship home at Norfolk in WHRO. I just ask everyone who's listening on podcast or on a radio station to ask yourself this. Why did Richard Nixon turn over the tapes when the Supreme Court voted 8-0 to that he must do that. He could have defied that order. We're we're there now. We're in a moment of defiance as we record this this program. Why did Nixon turn over the tapes? You have to ask yourself that question, and, and and you know the answer. And the answer is... He loved this country more even than his own incredibly complex self-regard. Hmm. He loved this country and knew that the rule of law is the one thing that we have. It's what differentiates us from Venezuela and Germany in the 30s and Russia in the 50s and 60s and Russia now and Iran and all these other countries. What we have is this sacred commitment to the rule of law. It's like when if, you know when I was growing up, if, if the referee said uh, foul, no one ever argued with the referee. You just said fair, okay, okay. That's but that that era is over. We, we need to agree to the rule of, of we need to agree to the rules of procedure of how a constitutional society works. And so you know, let's just say that um, I let's say that I'm. Oh, this is a good example on radio. Let's say we're on commercial radio, and we know that there are words you can't say. Everyone knows a few of those words, and our our host station says, "Okay, that's um, that can't happen again. You can't use that word. You just can't use that word." And I persist in using it. Then, if they say that's it, you can't come back into the studio. I have to say, "Fair enough. Those are the rules. I may or may not agree with them, but I implicitly agreed with them when I took my oath of office." If you caught me, and you're enforcing this rule. And it's a rule that has widespread bipartisan support. Uh, I will acquiesce, however much it breaks my heart. That's what you have to have in this situation. With that. Good luck. Let's go to the show. I, um, we, we tried to be fair about this. We tried to get Jefferson's perspective. Um, and we certainly would be happy to hear from any of you listeners. Um, if you have any questions about the Jefferson Hour, please go to jeffersonhour.com. We occasionally get letters, more than occasionally, from listeners who would like to get a copy of Clay's essay. You can find those at jeffersonhour.com. They're put up uh, every week. Occasionally, or, we're or, bombarded with requests. Or, or uh, as soon as we get them yeah, delivered. I've never had a request. Um, they come in, actually. I've never had a request. You can also support the show, and we really like like that a lot. And we if you disagree with today's Jefferson Watch, I Let just us ask know. you, Let us read know. it, listen to it again. Ask yourself wherein you disagree. Wherein do you disagree from a constitution of the United States point of view? Forget the partisanship. I lived through the, the Clinton impeachment and I lived through the Nixon near impeachment. That's one Democrat and one Republican. Ask yourself from a from a constitutional point of view where you disagree with the analysis. And let us know. And I'd like to know. Yeah, but yeah. pro or con, we, we really do I'm worried. It. You know, I think you can hear it in my voice today. I'm, I'm terrified. This is, this is the big moment. I could see it. This is the big moment. We'll see who we are. And thanks again for listening. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me is President Thomas Jefferson. And good day to you, sir. Good day to you, citizen. Mr. Jefferson, I'd like to talk to you about something of a serious nature this week. I've had your statement about the need to tear up the Constitution every generation is sort of ringing in my ears lately, because it seems that may be what is happening but perhaps not in the way you envisioned it, sir. I do believe that every generation should reinvent America according to its own needs and its own aspirations. And in a letter to Mr. Madison written from France, I said we should tear up the Constitution once every 19 or so years and start fresh. I certainly believe that. 
But while that constitution is in effect, once it's been ratified for the, the whatever length of time we, we give it, it needs to be rigorously adhered to. In other words, a constitution is a basic set of bylaws or procedures by which a nation attends to public business, how we elect the Senate, how we veto a bill, how we override a veto, uh, what sort of rights people have inherently that, that government can never touch. A constitution is a written document that spells out the limits of government and also shows the procedures by which that government will operate during the length of that constitution, whether it's 19 years or 90 years or 900 years, we need to adhere to its rules and procedures rigidly because it's what protects us from anarchy on the one hand and tyranny on the other. Well, Mr. Jefferson, there are those who say that we are now facing a constitutional crisis. I know, sir, that you are somewhat aware of this and also that you believe the earth belongs to the living. But, sir, I was hoping I could persuade you to comment on these current events and and perhaps share your insight. I can tell you my theory of the Constitution, and I think I can tell you what the Founding Fathers were most concerned about. Uh, Clearly, I wouldn't know enough about whatever the situation is in your time to be very useful, but I can certainly walk you through the idea of a republic and the checks and balances which that republic installs to prevent any branch of the government from running away with itself. I would prefer that we we make no attempt to arrive at judgment of any wrongdoing, or, but battle lines are being drawn over the impeachment powers of Congress. And in fact, the executive branch has chosen to ignore the will of Congress and refuses to acknowledge Congress's powers in this matter. This is a hard problem, and there is no easy, simple, or obvious answer to questions of this sort. We had grown up in a world of monarchy and the British ministry. In our colonial status, we were offended by the acts of the British ministry and eventually by the deeds of George III, uh, the King of England. So when we declared independence in July of 1776, each of the 13 original states now had to write its own new constitution. And we were all frightened of too much power in the executive, and we didn't want another monarchy. We'd had enough of that once and for all. So the new state constitutions moved to the other end of the spectrum and had weak executives, strong legislative branches, but weak executive branches. And I knew that in the long run that would not hold, but that was the the theory of the constitutions in our time. You want the president of the United States to have a great deal of power. He's the commander in chief. He's the only one who speaks for the entire nation in a moment of crisis. He also sets some of the agenda for the legislative branch. He has the power to enter into treaties uh, with foreign nations, although they must be ratified by the United States Senate. He has the power to name people to his, to his circle, to his cabinet, to, to government posts. You want the executive to have sufficient power to take charge when we need it and to have some latitude in moving the country forward on its preferred trajectory. At the same time, you want to make sure that that individual is never a monarch or a despot or a tyrant. And so there have to be checks against that executive's power. Otherwise, it inevitably will spin out of control. So the Founding Fathers, and I was not one of them, I was not in Philadelphia when this was done. I was in France. But the Founding Fathers met, and they were very concerned about the monarchical past, but they knew we needed some energy in government and some energy in the executive. And so they worked hard to create the presidency and to give the president enough authority to to get the things done that a nation must do, particularly in times of war, but to have some restraining mechanisms so that he would never think that he can govern without the legislature at the center of things. Understood, Mr. Jefferson. Um, We do need checks on the executive. What about checks on Congress? Now, there was a letter written by the White House counsel, and it claims the president's right to due processes have been violated, as well as the Constitution and the rule of law. 
and that this current inquiry is simply a strategy to influence the next election? First of all, let me say I don't know the facts of the case, so I'll explain to you what I think is the theory of the thing. There are three branches of the national government. All this comes from the the great work of of Montesquieu, the French political theorist who wrote a book called The Spirit of the Laws, which really outlined the structure of these things and, and became a blueprint for what we produced in the Constitution of the United States. Under this idea, the three branches of the national government, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary, are all nearly supreme within their own portfolio. They have to have a a large latitude to do their work. But each of them can be checked by one or both of the other two branches. So the obvious example is that Congress passes a law which the president decides is um, wrongheaded. The president can veto that law. That's his check against the Congress. But if the Congress is really in earnest about it, they can override that veto with a supermajority, not a simple majority. And if they do, that shows that there was enough will in Congress, enough consensus in Congress, a supermajority, that it could overcome the president's check on that piece of legislation. But let's say that the president was right and the Congress overrode it and is now violating the rights to freedom of religion of the citizens. Who decides then, sir? Now the courts step in. And so now the judicial branch steps in. They're the third branch, the the weakest, but the third. And they say, wait a minute, however popular this law is, it does seem to violate the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, the, the first article of the Bill of Rights. And so we, therefore, the the Supreme Court of the United States are telling you that this law, no matter how much support it has, violates a higher, more important, more fundamental law, the law of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And therefore, we must decide, we must declare that this law is in violation of the Constitution. It's unconstitutional. As you know, the courts do not have any enforcement power. At that point, the, leg- the legislature can say, well, thank you, uh, we hear you, but since you can't, you have no power to enforce your veto, we're going to go ahead with it. That would be a constitutional crisis, but it can't occur. And Andrew Jackson, in fact, did something quite similar to that uh, with respect to American Indians in the 1830s. Really what we're talking about, sir, is the congressional inquiry into the impeachment of a president. And to me, sir, the Constitution seems quite clear on this matter. It gives each House of Congress the sole power to, quote, determine the rules of its proceedings, meaning the House is not bound by the same requirements of the criminal justice system. So does the White House have a point? When the Founding Fathers created the Constitution in 1787, the question that they wrestled with was what happens if the executive spins out of control. Uh, They were worried about um, the will to power of certain individuals. They were worried about foreign um, interference in our elections or foreign sponsoring of one candidate over another. Uh, They wondered whether you could give enough power to an executive to make it possible for him to do his work and not have it intoxicate him and make him unwilling to live within any constitutional restraints. And so they wrestled with this. How will we, you know, how do we, how do we fix this problem? Well, there are two answers. One is that we have a re-election or an election of the president every fourth year. So no president can serve longer than four years without being re-endorsed by the people of the United States. So let's say you have a president who uh, becomes senile. You can get rid of him in four years. That's the longest he can possibly serve before you have it in your opportunity to vote him out of office. And that's the preferred remedy because elections matter. The people have spoken. They have named their president. They're entitled to have that president. And unless there is some extremely unusual circumstance, it would be a mistake to violate the will of the people once they have expressed it in the popular vote and in the electoral college. But if... There isn't time to wait for a quadrennial election. If, if, it's, if it seemed to be too urgent for that, then 
The House of Representatives has the power under our Constitution to indict the president. That's called impeachment. And by the way, there are no rules in the Constitution governing how that operates. The House of Representatives can set whatever rules it wishes. It does say high crimes and misdemeanors and bribes, but it is clear that the House of Representatives has sole power to decide whether it wishes to impeach a president or not, and there is no entity on earth uh, that can check that power. But once the House of Representatives indicts, either the president or another national official, the trial is held in the Senate. And in the Senate, there must be a two-thirds vote of conviction before that person is removed from office. So it takes a simple majority to indict a sitting president, and the rules are very flexible there. There is no set procedure outlined in the Constitution of the United States. But once indicted, once uh, impeached, the Constitution is clear that the Senate will sit in trial and that that trial will pre be presided over by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and that there will be rules of evidence, and that the court, which is the Senate, will eventually vote, and it takes a supermajority, a two-thirds majority in the Senate, to convict and therefore evict a sitting president. A most serious matter, sir. We need to take just a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. This week we're speaking with Mr. Jefferson about the Constitution. Is it, is it in crisis? And uh, we talked extensively about this in our first segment, but in looking back, Mr. Jefferson, um, what's really triggered this is uh, the concern of uh, foreign interference in American elections. This is something that that both you and Mr. Adams were quite concerned about and that when the Constitution was written, it, it was included. Well, all the Founding Fathers were concerned about this. So the biggest concern we had about our young and fragile republic, and, and believe me, it was very fragile in those first years, was that some foreign entity, uh, Spain or France or England, uh, would interfere, would, would bribe, or blackmail uh, a candidate or, or the, a sitting president, would pour money uh, into uh, an opposition group, uh, or would pour money into the coffers of the, of the incumbent, hoping that they would get better treatment in the international arena or most favored nation trading status, or, or that we would be able to edge out some other nation that wanted to trade for tobacco or indigo or, or naval stores or rice. So the Founding Fathers were, had done their homework. They knew from the history of republics that outside interference is a, is a very significant issue and that people who hold great power will be tempted with bribes and other uh, foreign emoluments, whether they succumb to that temptation or not. In other words, if you have power and, you believe, and you're in a great nation like ours, there will be other nations that if they could blackmail or bribe or compromise – would do so, of course. They're, they're trying to take advantage in the geopolitical system to the maximum extent that they can. This is inevitable. It's natural. I hope the United States will always behave in a more virtuous and restrained and enlightened way, but you can't count on any other nation behaving properly in such situations. So you have to create some sort of a, uh, a wall in our system to prevent this from happening. And so you hope you're always electing the best possible people. And I think on the whole, we will. But there may come a time when you have an individual who is susceptible to foreign interference, or in the case that you're talking about, even requests it, you know, openly and publicly requests it. And when that happens, it's a terrible problem because that's what the Founding Fathers were most concerned about, and that's one reason that they placed the impeachment power in the Congress of the United States, so that the, the people, and then their branch, of course, of the government is, is the Congress, that the people could, could take back the country if they felt that their chief, uh, their president, was being blackmailed or, or being coerced or, or was susceptible to some sort of a foreign emolument, then, then th this would protect us against that executive should he lose his character 
and behave in a way that was not in keeping with American due process or American principles. I found of interest a letter that you wrote to John Adams in November of 1787. One of the things that you were worried about in the new Constitution was that a president could be reelected every four years, and you felt that uh, it could go on and on, and he would be elected for life. You wrote, when one or two generations have proved that this is an office for life, it becomes on every succession worthy of intrigue, of bribery, of force, and even of foreign interference. You go on to say that it'd be great; it'd be of great consequence to France or England to have uh, an America governed by an Englishman or a, a Frenchman or a friend of those countries. I remember that letter very well. What I'm concerned about is that the government of the United States be truly sovereign and independent. And that's why I wanted the president to serve only a single term, perhaps of seven years, with perhaps a vote of confidence or no confidence in the middle. But if you have any reelectability after four years, if the president stands for reelection, two things are going to happen. That's going to change the way he governs because he's got to be thinking about reelection, not doing what's best for the country. And secondly, that gives outside entities, including our own corporations or very rich individuals or foreign states, that gives them an incentive to try to interfere and to to move the the executive election in the direction of its of its um, of its advantage and so if you had a single presidential term of 7 years outside entities couldn't interfere but the reelectability of a president automatically creates a distortion in the system so it as you know the founding fathers settled on a 4 year term they did not limit the number of terms. That has since come about in, in, in your time by constitutional amendment. But in our time, there was no limit on the number of terms that a president can serve. So let's say that John Adams was 35 years old, the, the, the constitutional limit, and elected to the presidency, and he lives to be 90. He could be reelected again and again and again and again and again and again and yes. serve essentially for life. <laughs> and in fact, sir, Mr. Adams thought that would just be a fine he, he uh, situation. He should, but that's not how, how it worked out. But we 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 had a we had an informal tradition of two terms only, which was set by George Washington. And then when I became the third president, I uh, declined to stand for a third term on that very principle that. If we set a kind of informal constitutional tradition of no more than two terms, then maybe nobody would ever dare to do it. Mr. Adams, he wrote, you are apprehensive the president, when once chosen, will be chosen again and again as long as he lives. And at Mr. Adams says, so much the better, it appears to me. So he disagrees with you on that point. It would almost seem that Mr. Adams had a little more faith in men than you, but he did agree with you completely, uh, writing, you are apprehensive of foreign interference, interest influence, so am I. And by the way, I am an optimist. I know, sir. I believe in, in, in humanity. I believe that humans are basically born good, not evil. But I said, and I meant, until they have power in their hands. Right. And the minute a person has power, we must now watch him like a hawk. A citizen can be trusted. A citizen who has an elective office, we must watch. And a citizen who has as much power as a president or a senator or a governor, we must watch with extraordinary vigilance because power will intoxicate and it will lead people to do things that they wouldn't even dream of doing if they were mere citizens. Mr. Adams goes on to close his letter with, Elections, my dear sir, elections to offices which are great objects of ambition, I look at with terror. Experiments of this kind have been so often tried and so universally found productive of horrors that there is great reason to dread them. Well, so here's... That's Mr. Adams, very let, much Mr. Adams. Let me right? try to describe Adams' view of this, and I don't think that I'm, I'm being sarcastic. His view was, elect someone like me, John Adams, <laughs> and then let me serve essentially for life because I'm a good and virtuous person and you can trust me, but only if you have someone you can trust like me do you want to have a presidency that essentially is reelectable for life? So, you know, this is the this is the mistake we make in our civics, my friend. We think that every Supreme Court justice is going to be a pure lover of justice, uh, the rule of law, 
truth, well, we evidence. Can, we can hope, sir. And we hope we assume that every president is going to be disinterested and uh, and, and, and a person of great character, uh, grounded in humility and, and a modesty of temperament, who has good judgment. They're not all going to be George Washington. They're not all even going to be John Adams. You know, in my lifetime, let's go through this. John Hancock was the president of the of the Continental Congress, and and in, in my opinion, he was a self-aggrandizing, egotistical man of limited capacity. But that's before the Constitution. Once the Constitution was created and ratified, George Washington, two terms. John Adams, one. Myself, two. James Madison, two. James Monroe, two. John Quincy Adams, one. Andrew Jackson, two. Of those presidents, nobody would have ever been impeached. There was, of course, talk of impeachment because there always is, but there was no significant push at any time to impeach any one of those people, including Andrew Jackson, who was a person I thought was unfit for the presidency, but he was elected. As I said, you and Mr. Adams corresponded about your fears of foreign interference, but this was not a new idea. Um, You bring up Mr. Washington. In September of 1796, in his farewell address, he said, quote, against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, the jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake, since history and experience prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of Republican government. Citizen, please read that again. That foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of Republican government. And let me say the only thing that is worse than that correct assessment of foreign interference, the only thing that could possibly be worse than that was an American executive or candidate asking for that foreign meddling or interference. It's one thing for France to want to interfere in our election. That's what nations do. We must guard against it, as George Washington says. But if you have someone within our own system, a citizen of the United States who's either an incumbent or a candidate who's asking for foreign intervention, that's precisely what the Founding Fathers would have regarded as a nightmare scenario. And they put into the Constitution a mechanism, several of them, uh, to prevent that. And one of them, of course, is quadrennial elections. So you could wait until the next election if you think you can. If you think you can't wait, uh, there's impeachment and a trial by the Senate. And there also is the power of the purse. So the House of Representatives must be the originator of every dollar ever spent in this country. And if it wanted to, it could prevent monies from going to the executive or some of the executive's projects if they felt that was the only way to to restrain that person. Sir, as usual, you have arrived at the crux of the matter, and that is uh, currently our president is, is uh, I don't want to say being accused, but there's a, um, a concern that he has done just that, that he has asked for help from a foreign government. And uh, I don't want to make any judgments. I'm certainly not in a position to know all of the facts. But Congress should be in a position to know all the facts. And that is really what the inquiry is about. Well, there are ambiguities and um, porous boundaries in all systems of of government, including in constitution. So let's take something that's easier to talk about, emoluments. So let's say that I'm the president of the United States, but I also have a, a tobacco plantation back at Charlottesville, which I did. And now I need to make a decision about our import and export relations with France or England. And that's going to have an effect on the price of tobacco. So that's a potential conflict of interest because my personal interest may be at odds with the public interest and my duties to represent the entire American nation and not just my own uh, economic sector or my own personal interests. But there will be case after case after case in the course of a nation's history in which there is some ambiguity, some, you know, we're not certain that this applies, you know, what's enforceable and and what's inevitable. Uh, How do we know that there's been 
um, uh, some sort of a um, influence coming from from personal economic self interest and so on. There are areas where you just have to shrug your shoulders and say, "I hope that our our political figures are virtuous and, and men of character." But there are certain things that you probably can't get at, even if you sense that they're wrong. And there are probably many instances of honest disagreement about such things. But this case that you're talking about, this hypothetical case of a of an executive, an incumbent who would actually ask a foreign sovereign to interfere in the election of the United States, that's black and white. Any one of the founding fathers would have said, if that can be shown to have been true, that is automatically a disqualification for that person continuing in office, if that can be shown to be true. And that qualifier, if it can be shown to be true, is is quite important, which is why I say I don't want to sit in judgment. I don't have all the facts. Um, it's Congress's job to get those. Let me take. Let me give you another example, just quickly. If uh, let's say that that um, Mr. Madison has a, an extramarital affair with a with a woman in his in his neighborhood. I, I doubt that would happen. That's sir. why I chose it because it's an it's a moral impossibility. And by the way, Dolly Madison would have clubbed him. <laughs> she was a much stronger human being than her diminutive husband. But at any rate, let's say this happened. Then we would have to decide, is that uh, an impeachable offense? Is that a private matter? Is that a public matter? Well, uh, that's a good question. You know, the, the president We don't has, know in certain instances. But, but you were president, sir. You, you had what we would call a fiduciary responsibility to the citizens of the United States. You were in charge of making sure that the country was well run, looking for their future. Is that impeachable? Yes. So uh, the House of Representatives has the right to impeach an executive that they believe has abused his power or taken bribes, or committed high crimes and misdemeanors, or is incapacitated in one way or another. Those amendments which you now have for an incapacitated president didn't exist in my time. So the Founding Fathers wisely put in a, a, a procedure, a tool, so that the, the main branch of government, the, the most important of the three, the legislative branch, could in extremity have a remedy for something that went terribly wrong. Is an extramarital affair that? I don't know. I would say no. That's a private matter. Is a, a potentially, a vaguely potential emoluments issue about conflict of interest? I would say you want to bend over backwards to accommodate that even if it, if it stinks a little in your nostrils. You want open and shut cases. So if the president said, if we discovered that, that a president was a secret agent of Portugal, that he was being paid $100,000 per year by the nation of Portugal to undermine American sovereignty and to open the port at Norfolk uh, to foreign invasion, there'd be no question that that's a high crime and misdemeanor and abuse of office. He must go. You can take those cases which are obvious, and then you have cases at the other end which are going to be more difficult. And you have to apply the Constitution thoughtfully, and you have to have the kind of reasonable man standard of what would a rational person who's non-political think of in looking at this situation. But I will tell you this, any executive who asks for foreign interference in an election, and that can be proved, that's an open and shut, black and white, obvious, no-brainer sort of problem for the Constitution of the United States. There is one thing about this that bothers me more than anything else, if I might tell you, sir. Maybe you can Please. help me with it. Um, at present, as far as I can tell, no, I might be incorrect, but every single member of the opposition party wants the president convicted for this. And every member of the president's party says there is nothing to see here, there is nothing wrong. That bothers me deeply. Ah, but the wisdom of the founders. Here's where you can bow to the wisdom of the founders. The president cannot be removed without 67 votes in the Senate. That is a supermajority. That means that the, it cannot be done by one party. One party can impeach if it has a majority in the House of Representatives. You don't want one party to do that. You want a bipartisan approach if you can. I want statesmen who will stand up for what is right and not their party. But my point is that you cannot uh, remove a president on a party vote unless you have 67 members of that party 
in the United States Senate, which almost never occurs, maybe has never occurred. And so you have the Founding Fathers built in a way to prevent a partisan removal. It has to be bipartisan if you're going to get, in this case, if you're going to get uh, 17 or so members of the other party, of the incumbent party, to convict, that will only happen if they are convinced that there is a bipartisan consensus in this country that this person must be removed. That's, that's, that's something that should make you raise a glass of Bordeaux wine to James Madison and the Founding Fathers. There can be no naked partisan eviction of a president. A good way to stop this part of the conversation, bowing to the wisdom and the will of the American people. Mr. Jefferson, as always, I thank you so much for your time and for your insights, sir. I wish you all well. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson. I have removed my wig and tights and my buckled shoes. Sitting across from me, the semi-permanent guest host of The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome. All right, so I, I just want to say what I just said. You know, there's, we're in this nakedly, deeply, appallingly partisan time where everything is, is up and down party votes, including uh, in the Supreme Court of the United States. But the founders were extraordinary. They said you have to have a supermajority. And you know what? There have been three previous impeachment crises in this country. Andrew Johnson after the death of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Bill Clinton for his um, perjury in his relations with women. Uh, Richard Nixon, who was not impeached but was about to be impeached and resigned instead, and now this. Uh, I believe that it's almost certain that this president will be impeached by the House, which, by the way, you remind yourself again and again, is not removal. It's just an indictment. So this is the fourth significant impeachment episode in our history. It's pretty good for 45 administrations, but never once— Has there been a conviction in the Senate? Not once. My point is that the founders' insistence on a supermajority is an incredibly important American thing because otherwise, in this era, you just have an impeachment of this person and an impeachment of that person. It would be done by just as a political tool. They didn't want it to be a political tool. They wanted it to be a response to an obvious and and clear and present emergency in which a a solid supermajority of all the people in the United States Senate said, oh my goodness, we have to pull we have to pull the lever on this and we have to get rid of this person. It's never happened because the bar is so high. And even though that may frustrate some partisan Democrats, they should be happy that the bar is so high. It should be, right. And so we're going to see here. So if let's just put it this way, if Donald Trump is forced out of the presidency before the next election, it will be because uh, 15, 16, 17, or 20 members of, of the United States Senate who are Republicans have become convinced that he must go. If they are not convinced that he must go, he will stay. And I think you heard Jefferson, David, saying, elections matter. You have better be very, very, very hesitant to remove an elected president of the United States, even if you think he's a schnook or that you don't like him or you hate his policies or he's vulgar. Whatever your your beef against him, your indictment is, you had be extremely cautious to step between the sovereign, the American people, and their elected representative, the president of the United States, when an election is looming. Um, you know, every fourth year. Now, four years was an easier term back then because nothing happened in the world. Today, four years is an eternity in an age of cruise missiles. But I take the founder's point that you, and Jefferson's particularly, that if you start messing with the people's will, you are in danger as a nation. I don't think it's partisan to say that there are a whole new set of norms, as you put it, uh, the guide rails have gone off or something yeah, like we, that. We're, we, as you'll hear in the today's Jefferson Watch, we have one guardrail left, and that's the United States Senate. We'll see. If the current president is successful in doing all of these things that are sort of outside, well, outside the box, um, different than the norm, the next president will be able to do the same thing. I mean, there's a precedent being set, or am I worrying too much? No, I think I think you're right. I don't I don't necessarily think that once the bar 
is lowered. It stays low forever. I think Gerald Ford turned out to be a person who respected the law, who raised the tone of the presidency. Yeah, he did. Jimmy Carter came to power saying, I'll never lie to you, and he and he never did. Ford said it's time to heal. And so, he? I yeah. mean, it, it's, it, it's not as if it's all downhill from a bad moment. But but I do think that we're, we have to be very careful here. So, you know, if you talk to partisan um, admirers of the current president, they will say, well, we don't like his style very much and we disagree with a lot of his tweets and wish he would stop tweeting, but his policies are something that we like. So is vulgarity, is shattering norms, is being um, vulgar, are these impeachable offenses? I say clearly not. No. Clearly not. Not. Um, is but uh, You know what they are? They're exhausting. It's like, it's that's like, different. It's like McCarthy. People just got so exhausted with him, they finally they couldn't take it anymore. We are exactly a year from a quadrennial presidential election. We're going to have to, as a nation, this is not about the Republican Party. It's not about the Democratic Party. It's about the United States of America now. It's a constitutional crisis. It's not a political crisis. It's a constitutional crisis. We're going to have to decide as a people, first of all, do we think that this president has committed high crimes and misdemeanors? That do we think that he's abused his office to the point that it would we have we have to remove him? That's number one, and I, I think the answer to that is going to be probably no. The second thing is, do you shrug your shoulders and say, "Let's just let the election decide this," uh, because that's how the system was set up to work? You know what 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 the partisans say is that we knew this going in. We knew what kind of a person this was. It's there's no there's no surprise here. He he told us everything he stood for before he became the president of the United States. We knew about the women. We knew about in Russia. If you're listening, we knew about the vulgarity. We knew about the name calling. We knew about the, the 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 emoluments problems. We knew all of this going in, and he was elected president of the United States. That's a kind of a mandate. And so you have to make sure that if you're going to evict, it has to be for something that any rational person would say is an abuse of the Constitution of the United States. It was great to talk to Mr. Jefferson this week, and I think we both made a real effort, I made a real effort, speak for myself, um, to keep uh, above board and fair on this and not be judgmental, um, to hear what Jefferson had to say. You, on the other hand, personally have some quite strong views, and we're going to hear those. I have never felt more strongly than I do about the following Jefferson Watch. Because it is now time for this week's Jefferson Watch. Checks and balances, Mr. Jefferson. Checks and balances, said John Adams. We are only a republic if each of the three branches of the national government has some capacity to check the excesses of one or both of the other two. My friends, the words constitutional crisis are thrown about too often, but I must tell you, we are in one now. We are dancing on the brink of the first true constitutional crisis of our history, at least since the Civil War. We came close in 1973-74 after the Saturday Night Massacre, but in the end, Richard Nixon turned over the White House tapes. He resigned. He did not threaten to defy the U.S. federal court system. He did not burn the tapes in the wake of the Supreme Court's unanimous ruling that he must relinquish them to the House Judiciary Committee. Nixon did not refuse to leave office. In fact, he was so ashamed to be reduced to impeachment or resignation that he told his closest aides he hoped to go to sleep at night and never wake up again. He wanted to die of shame. In the end, even Nixon was a constitutionalist. He respected the basic norms of our system. In extremis, he believed in the rule of law, though he had been playing fast and loose with the law for several years. He turned over the tapes. He left peacefully. He got on the helicopter, and he waved farewell. The Trump White House has said it will not comply with the House of Representatives' impeachment investigation. It has declared that the impeachment is unconstitutional, which is ludicrous, an insane assertion, since the Constitution is quite clear, investing impeachment power solely with the House of Representatives. Still, the White House declares that it will not turn over documents and it will not let administration personnel testify before Congress, 
even under subpoena. An impasse? Now what? Well, our system is designed to address that problem. The House will presumably use the federal courts to compel the White House to cooperate in the investigation. It would be unlikely for the courts to side with the administration. The Constitution is quite clear about the impeachment power, and in our system the Constitution trumps all other laws and protocols. But it is at least possible that the courts will side with Mr. Trump. If they did, that alone would mean the death of the American Republic, because the courts would be saying there is no check on a president's actions. You cannot indict a sitting president, and you cannot impeach him either. In other words, there's no remedy. Assuming the federal courts compel President Trump to cooperate with the House impeachment investigation, what happens if he simply refuses to comply with the federal court order? Now what? Nixon turned over the tapes, but there is no reason to believe that President Trump would do the same. If Mr. Trump refuses to abide by the ruling of the federal judicial system and the House of Representatives passes articles of impeachment, as all the experts say it certainly will, then the actual last guardrail in our Republican system of government, the last tool of the U.S. Constitution in the face of a runaway executive, will be a trial in the Senate where the founders wisely insisted that you must muster a supermajority, 67 senators, to remove a sitting president. This has never happened in our history, not in any of the three prior impeachment episodes, three if you count Nixon, as well as Bill Clinton and Andrew Johnson. We have read, and I believe, that if there could be a secret ballot in the Senate, 20 Republican senators at least and already would vote to convict the president and remove him from office, perhaps 30. In other words, there is a widespread tacit agreement in the most senior political body in the United States that it would be best for the republic if Donald Trump were removed from the presidency using this legitimate constitutional tool. But it will not be a secret ballot. Even if Senator X believes the president should be removed, she may not dare to make that judgment for fear that an angry mob of Trumpites will burn down her house or run her down while jogging. I'm not joking. The fear of the wrath of Trump's supporters is real and goes well beyond the fear of being primaried in the next election cycle. I hope to God there is a deep state, by which I mean some implicit, unspoken, mutual love of this country and its constitution, some baseline mutual understanding of how close we now are to a dictatorship, to the suspension of elections, to the expulsion of Muslims, to the arrest of journalists, etc. If you think I'm joking or exaggerating, Just print out the president's pronouncements on these subjects and his periodic suggestions that he would like to have dictatorial powers. What other president has ever said that? The last guardrail we have is the U.S. Senate. But if the Senate votes not to evict President Trump, then nothing can remove him from office, and it is not clear that he will leave quietly even if he is not re-elected in November 2020. What if he decides the 2020 election was rigged and he declares martial law for the good of the country? What if he suspends the 2020 elections? I know you think I'm overreacting, but I've spent my life thinking about these things, and I'm generally cheerful. Generally speaking, I think we always lurch on in spite of everything and that we will weather the political storms that come at us with increasing frequency, but I am now openly and at times sleeplessly afraid for my country. My friends, I address you with the deepest seriousness of anything I have said or written on the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We are on the brink of a national constitutional collapse. Carl Bernstein has said it for about 18 months that we are living through a cold civil war. I have thought that he was right, but of course I have wondered if he and I are overreacting, overdramatizing, overworrying. But we are not exaggerating. We are indeed in a cold civil war, and I want to tell you that I think it is going to flare up into a hot civil war in some parts of this country as things reach absolute impasse sometime in the next few months. One argument being advanced by administration defenders is that while the president's attempt to pressure the Ukrainians to dig up or manufacture dirt on Mr. Trump's political opponent is bad, and very bad, it does not rise to the level of impeachment. 
that impeachment is too grave for this instance of abuse of power. First of all, I disagree. The smoking gun in Nixon's long train of abuses and usurpations, as Mr. Jefferson puts it, was the audio tape in which the president instructed his chief of staff to pressure the CIA to pressure the FBI to drop the Watergate investigation on the grounds that it would jeopardize national security. That was enough to remove Richard Nixon. Here we have a president pressuring a foreign head of state to investigate, I use air quotes, his chief political rival, while coyly, or really not so coyly, holding back $391 million in urgently needed military aid. This seems equally bad, or perhaps worse than the June 23, 1972 smoking gun tape. Second, I ask you to think about the idea of impeachment. If this is not an impeachable offense, pressuring a foreign sovereign to discredit a political rival so that re-election will be easier, then what is an impeachable offense? What would it take? What would President Trump have to do to deserve impeachment if trying to disrupt the American principle of free and fair elections does not qualify? And yet, President Trump knows that he has one fabulous asset in this crisis. Out beyond the beltway is an angry army of street-smart citizens who believe he is the answer that Donald Trump is the last chance to save America, and that any attempt to remove him is nothing more or less than a deep state conspiracy to void free and fair elections. Mr. Trump has a private army of about 40 million people out there, some of them my friends. The question is whether we can restore some health to the system before the army of the outraged explodes in violence. The pressure is on the United States Senate. Even the Republicans who might want to do the right thing are scared to place that vote. And yet they must know that they are all that stands between us and a kind of tyranny. It may be a farcical and inept tyranny, but it will be a tyranny nevertheless. I know we think it can't happen here. I know we think that Donald Trump's wild statements about authoritarianism are just a sloppy form of rhetorical excess, a kind of parody of authoritarianism, beating and locking up journalists, calling journalists enemies of the state, vowing to lock up political opponents, saying a member of the House of Representatives has committed treason, suggesting that we shoot illegal immigrants at our borders in the legs, threatening to expel Muslims, including Muslim Americans, saying that he will overturn the 14th Amendment, i.e. birthright citizenship, by executive order. This may all be just bombastic language. But what if the Senate removes the last guardrail, legal eviction, and the president then realizes that there is no further check on his behavior? I'm asking you to think about this and to have a dinner party where you discuss it. In fact, I wish you would discuss this essay line by line and decide where I may have a point and where I am full of beans. Whatever else is going on in your lives, I ask you to turn your attention to this constitutional crisis, read the Federalist Papers, especially numbers 65 and 66, and ask yourself what this president would do if there were no check on his impulses and his actions. I know many of you are supporters of President Trump. If you are a Trump supporter, I ask you to think nevertheless about the argument that I'm making here. And remember this, the next president of the United States who exceeds his constitutional authority may be a Democrat. This isn't about politics. It's about the United States Constitution. I'm Clay Jenkinson, and I'm terrified. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. 
The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.